Ready to elevate your leadership? Follow Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast now. Transform inspirations into actions. Hit follow and lead with impact. Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Our guest today is a visionary leader at the forefront of transforming industries in earth moving, construction, infrastructure development, and mining. With a background in engineering and a passion for storytelling, he has revolutionized the dirt world through innovative digital marketing strategies. His journey embodies entrepreneurial spirit and a dedication to showcasing the industry's unsung heroes. From leading a team of over 80 individuals to traversing the nation and beyond to explore job sites, he is on a mission to make the dirt world a better place. Please welcome the self-proclaimed chief dirt nerd and CEO of BuildWit, Aaron Witt. So Aaron, welcome to the Dale Carnegie Take Command podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, it's good to see you again. So I saw you at the Dirt World Conference, which you put together, which we'll talk about in October, which is a fabulous conference. And prior to that was you hosting me on your podcast, which was a blast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad we've spoken a few times before this. It makes it a little easier. Well, what you've accomplished is pretty impressive. I know that our listeners are really going to enjoy learning about you. You are the founder of BuildWit. I'll let you describe what BuildWit is, but you're also not just the founder of BuildWit. You are the CEO. You are the chief dirt nerd. Tell us about uh, BuildWit and how'd you get that title? I grew up in Scottsdale, Arizona. Father's a tax lawyer, so no blue collar background at all growing up. But a construction project appeared in my neighborhood when I was a senior in high school thinking about what do I do with my life? And this project appeared and I was like a moth to a flame. I couldn't get enough of it. So I figured if I want to be around this more, I could get a job in construction and then I'll be around it every day. So I Google the company name. I find out who owns the company. I call the office, ask for the guy that owns it, Rich Pearson. I meet with Rich Pearson after school one day, drive from high school down to his office and I ask for a job. And he doesn't give me a job at first because he couldn't legally hire me at 17. I turn 18. I call him again. I still want that job. He hires me as a laborer. And so a week after high school, I started as a laborer on a construction crew. And it was my first time in construction, on job sites, doing anything blue collar related whatsoever, which was a shock to say the least. But fortunately, I had good people on the crew that I was on and they took care of me and I fell in love with construction and knew this was the world for me. And so... Mr. Pearson, he gave me some career advice. He said, go to work for as many companies as you can to go figure out what you want to do. It's a big industry. So go experiment and then go get an engineering degree. So I did both those things. I graduate. I go into road construction after college. And that was my plan. I wanted to be Mr. Pearson. I wanted to have wit, my last name, on heavy equipment because to a 20-year-old, 22-year-old, there's nothing cooler than that. (laughs) It's red sports cars. It's heavy equipment. It's monster trucks. Like That's cool. And so I was going to work, save up and start a business. But after I graduated college, I started to share some pictures and videos and experiences from my time in construction, brief time in construction on social media, on Instagram. And it really started to grow. And one, two, six, eight months after I graduate college, I call my parents, say, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to move back in and I'm starting a company to take pictures of bulldozers. And the initial thesis of the business, BuildWit, was, hey, construction, mining, the dirt world, as we call it, infrastructure, these are amazing industries that hold our whole society together. But people don't know that. And there's this big workforce challenge, this older generations aging out, this newer generations nowhere to be found. And if we want to get people in the trades, we have to first educate them about what the heck it is that these people do and what these companies do. So... We, over subsequent years, built a marketing business focused on telling the story of the dirt world. Companies that help get water to your house, internet, roads, bridges, power, 
the backbone of society. And then, okay, cool. You get these people in the door, but they're like me, you know, they don't know anything. They've never been on a job site. So how do we train them? And so two years ago, we started developing a video based training software to teach people, construction workers, not just how to read a tape measure, run equipment, but how to lead more effectively, communicate more effectively, take care of their body more effectively. And then you bring people in the door, you train them up, you want to keep them. And that's when leadership, a lot of what Dale Carnegie teaches comes into play. And so we built a summit you alluded to a conference for leaders in construction to talk about how we can better care for our people. So that's our business, helping the dirt world attract, train, and then keep great human beings. Well, I definitely want to unpack it. You've covered an awful lot. Certainly, I think a lot of this interview is going to be about vision and your boldness because you know you took a risk in starting this business. You just took a risk in doing this conference, which we'll talk about a little bit. You're someone who puts it all out there. But I just want to go back for a second. I mean, because there's this progression. You see this project. You're enamored with this project. You decide you want to be around construction and dirt and surf, so forth. And you get an engineering degree in college, right? So your goal is to come out and to be in the construction industry. You tell your parents, hey, I'm moving back in and I want to start this company. What was their reaction? How did they respond? And what was that like? They've always been 100%. Whatever you want to do, we're on board with. And so people give me credit for where I am at my age, but I give a lot of credit to my parents because they put me in this position that I'm in in the first place. They teed me up and gave me the hand I was dealt. And so when I went to them and said, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to become a construction worker, they were like, cool, great, have fun. All of my friends' parents were scratching their heads, seriously concerned. What are you doing? So you're doing what this summer? It didn't even make sense to them, but my parents were 100% on board. When I went and moved, I worked in California in college. I worked in Washington in college. I moved to Texas after school. Hey, go wherever you want to do, do whatever you want to do. And then when I moved back in to start the company, they could not have been more supportive. And so I've tried to maximize that because I know most people don't have that support and I've tried to make the most of it. Yeah. And I'd like to ask about what your advice would be for people who don't have that kind of support, because on the one hand, you get the voice of your parents who are supporting you, which is a huge voice, especially when we're younger, we're looking for the approval of our parents. They have certain expectations of us. We don't want to disappoint our parents. Your parents supported you. And yet so many times in life, there's some vision that we have for ourselves and other people are saying, Hey, Aaron, that doesn't make any sense. They're scratching their heads. They're saying you're throwing away your future, not in your particular case, but just in whatever it might be that I might want to do or that our listeners want to do. People will say that. So what advice do you have for people when you've got a vision like you had, but all those people who told you you shouldn't be doing this, Aaron, do something different. What advice do you have for people on that? On this note, you know, ironically, my parents were very supportive in the beginning, but I have one parent that hasn't spoken to me in two years. A lot of that is because of the business and it's really sad. And fortunately I'm in therapy and I've learned how to manage my emotions and figure things out more effectively while tempting to just go back and, okay, you know, I'll do what you want me to do. I view it as I have to be who I'm supposed to become. I have to do what is best for me because if I do what's best for me, then I can better serve others. And that to me is, I think, especially in my twenties, my biggest job is I need to prioritize myself and becoming all that I can be as an individual, because if I'm all that I can be as an individual, as a leader, as a business owner, whatever it is, then I can best serve all of those around me. And so while it's not fun to not have the support, especially of those around you that love and care for you, I don't think their lack of support is anything personal. I think because they care for you, they say, hey, that's risky. Don't go do that. But I feel like you know what you should and shouldn't do. And I've always chased what I think is best for me. Yeah, there's a cost to it. And I don't think that cost is discussed all that much. There is a cost. I just see that as almost unavoidable because again, my job as a human being is to become all that I can be. Because if I'm all that I can be, then I can best serve others is at least how I've rationalized it in my head. Well, thanks for sharing that, Aaron. And thanks for sharing that story. I know that that's not easy when we have challenges in relationship. And at the same time, we do have to, like you said, be true to ourselves. In fact, when Michael Crom and I were writing the book, Take Command, one of the things we were wondering was, what's the number one regret that people have in their deathbeds? And what we found was that people didn't live a life true to themselves. They lived based on what other people thought that they should do, or they failed to be bold. They failed to take chances. They were afraid of what would happen if they went the way that they wanted to do. So 
in such a way, I mean, I think it's an inspiring example that you've set that you've got this conviction for yourself. And it's not always easy. I remember going from the practice of law and going into business and leaving that and people saying, you spent three years going to law school, you took the bar exam, you know, what are you doing? You're throwing your career away. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have to do the things that we think are right. Yeah, I think it's essential. And I think the greater risk is not doing that. And like you said, being on your deathbed and realize, oh no, what have I done? And the opportunity has gone at that point. I think that's the greater risk than to give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at least, you know, hey, I gave it a shot. I did it. I tried it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, what's the alternative? It's like you don't do it and then you spend your life having regrets. It's like, gosh, I wonder what would have happened if I had done this or if I'd gone the way that I wanted to go. But when I look at what you've done with BuildWit, there's a marketing aspect, there's a creative aspect to this where you're really telling the story and you're passionate about the dirt world. And this is a term that you've phrased. Tell our listeners what the dirt world is and what is it about the dirt world that just makes you so passionate that you really want to tell the dirt world stories? I started telling the dirt world stories purely based on selfish emotion. I just love bulldozers. I don't know what about bulldozers as it is, but I love machines that push dirt around. It is just cool. Everything about it. The first time a dozer went by me, roaring, pushing all this dirt in front of it, the tracks moving the earth under your feet, it's intoxicating. And so I started telling those stories because it was just what excited me. Over the course of the past six plus years, I've had the opportunity to travel almost weekly to different job sites, mine sites, not just in the United States, but abroad. I've been all over the world from the Middle East to China, to Australia, to South America, and seen some amazing places, met some amazing people. After I started to travel, just fell in love with the purpose that this industry has. And that is quite literally supporting everybody else. Modern life isn't possible without this industry. If you don't have water at your house, you can't do anything. If you don't have power, you can't do anything. Internet can't do anything. Can't drive anywhere, can't fly anywhere, can't turn the lights on. That's what this world does. The trash just doesn't disappear. It's got to go somewhere. Someone's got to take it there. And so I fell in love with the purpose that this world has, but there wasn't really a term for it. So that's when we made up Dirt World years ago was what's a fun term for this industry, this group of people that really supports our society, that handles everything that's in the dirt every day, making sure that you can be a lawyer, that I can be a business owner, that we can be moms and dads and whatever we want to be in our lives. It's because of these people that we can have that opportunity. And I've just fallen in love with serving these people and putting them on a pedestal, building a stage so that they can at least get some recognition for what they do, because what they do is really important. Yeah, you're really telling their stories and you're amplifying their voice and you're looking at common problems and really defining solutions, certainly around training and recruiting and culture and some of the different things that people in the dirt world are struggling with. Tell us about BuildWit. You started this concept. What has worked the way you wanted it to work? What's been a surprise? What's been harder than you thought it would be? We're operating without a map, without a blueprint. <laughs> We've had to build our business through trial and error. Storytelling has always been I think a really good thing for us. And we've built a huge social presence because of our storytelling. So I reach millions of people every day, every week, tens of millions of people every week with our social media presence now, which is amazing. Tens of millions of people. Yes. You're creating viral videos and things that are really getting out to people to amplify that message. Yeah, it's incredible how many people, our videos, our photos reach, our podcasts. It's amazing. I think that's something we've always done well is tell the story and be authentic. I think the hardest part about it all has been figuring out how to lead and not to tee you up with that one. But being a young person, starting a business at 22 years old, you don't know anything. I still don't know anything at 28. And to be now responsible for over 60 full-time people at the business and to put something on the internet that's seen by potentially millions of people, any one thing you put out and to be traveling around the world and to just have all of this going on in your life and having to serve as an example for others. And there's a lot to learn there. I was just talking with someone this morning on our podcast about, I'll listen to myself even a year ago, even six months ago, and I'll just be like, what an idiot. I'll almost be embarrassed about the things I was saying just not that long ago because of what I've learned since and how I've refined my uh, communication style and how I've learned to craft a message. The biggest challenge has been figuring out how to be a leader, figuring out what a leader is. Because when I started, I had no idea what a leader was. 
and then figuring out how I can be a more effective leader. And beyond that, the changes in business are hard because of people. And so navigating the relationships and pouring into people, but then also hurting people and having to reconcile with that and having to face the shame and embarrassment that is making mistakes that don't just harm myself, but others and sometimes many others. Like I was thinking yesterday, you know, someone that's 30 years old, they've maybe hurt a few people in their life like really hurt a few people. You know, I broke up with him or her, or I did this or that, you know, I ruined this friendship, that friendship. We've hurt a lot of people. (laughs) It's never been intentional, but that's just something that I've really had to grapple with, especially over the past few years, as we've made some financial mistakes and as we've overspent and as we have adjusted our business and changed our teams, there's people that get caught in the crosshairs and it all comes back to me at the end of the day. It's all on my shoulders. So navigating myself through that burden has been an interesting, interesting experience. Well, it's a tough part. Certainly there are great things about leadership and glamorous things about leadership. And then there are the real challenges. And certainly some of the decisions you have to make are not great decisions or great decisions that people like. And certainly they have impact on people. And, you know, so much of it is ultimately about living by our integrity, I think, and our authenticity, I want to ask you about leadership. I have to make one comment, though. You said, you know, you're 28. You don't feel like you know anything. I was well into my 30s before I felt like I knew anything. I know exactly what you're talking about because you're learning along the way. But that's also part of, I think, growing is you have that open mind. You learn, you develop along the way, and then you get some experience and some wisdom and some knowledge. But I want to go back to leadership because the question I have, Aaron, is what is a leader to you and how do you define leadership? I think I've learned that a leader is someone that influences others in a positive way is the best definition I've been able to come up with. And so I feel like most people fell into the trap of thinking a leader is the one that has the answers, is the one out in front, is leading the charge, is always confident. You get taught leadership through all of these examples that are completely incorrect, (laughs) through stories and movies and television and songs almost all of it's completely wrong. You have to learn that, wow, so everything I've learned is wrong. And if I actually flip it, if I actually take the inverse of it, a leader doesn't talk all the time. A leader actually listens more than they talk so that when they do talk, they can figure out what to say. They've collected that data. They've heard the different viewpoints and then they can summarize and look at it from their perspective and then say that one thing that's hopefully, oh, okay, uh, yeah, that is what we ought to do. And so I've had to like I said, learn what leadership was. I think it's positively influencing others. And then I've had to, you know, starting with daily actions, figure out, so what am I doing well? What am I not doing well? And what do I need to start adjusting to be a more effective leader? Am I being a good example for others? Am I holding others accountable? Am I having those hard conversations when I don't want to? I don't want to have those hard conversations, but I better be leaning into those. Am I communicating effectively? They're not understanding it. Well, that's their fault. It's not their fault. It's my fault. I'm not communicating effectively. So what do I need to do to communicate more effectively? Do I need to write better, speak better? I've started public speaking over the past 16 months. I don't want to public speak. I'm not a public speaker, but hey, if I can learn how to present ideas to an audience more effectively, then I can be a better leader. And so I've one had to learn what leadership really is. And then two, I've had to put it into daily practice and it's every single day. How were my conversations? What could I have done better? What went well? What didn't go well? And then how can I improve for tomorrow? Well, one thing I know you do, you're more of a night person. We've talked about cyber routine in the morning. I do exactly what you talked about in the morning. That's when I'm sharp. In the evening, I have a hard time stringing together a couple sentences in an email, so I try to do all that early, but you're a night person. So what is your night routine and how do you continue to sharpen your saw to be a better leader? I have what I call chores and they're what I need to do to make sure that I'm physically, emotionally, mentally sharp. I figured out I need to take care of myself so that I can be most effective for others. And so every day I work out, I eat well, very rarely drink alcohol, sleep very well every day. What's good sleep for you? How many hours of sleep is it? Last night I got nine hours. Nine hours of sleep? Yeah. I sleep well as much as I can. You know, no family, no pets, nothing. So I can go to bed whenever I want. 
But in the evening, I have what I call my chores. I read 10 pages of a book every day. I practice a different language, Spanish, and then I write a page. All it is, I have a black notebook I bring everywhere, and I just write down, here's what I did today. Here's how I felt today. Hey, I had a little bit of anxiety today. And this is maybe why I had some anxiety. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Or, hey, I had this conversation. I feel like it went well. I spoke to this audience. Here's what I think I could have done a little bit better. Here's a lesson I learned. There's never a strategy to how I'm going to fill the page. I just start at the top. I stop when I'm at the bottom. And that's it. And I've done it for years now. I heard someone explain it. His name is John Donaher. He's a jujitsu teacher. He summarized it so well. He said, a lot of people go from day to day to day to day to day, and they don't really take the time to figure out what they learned in that given day so that they can't really take those lessons and apply it to the next day. And so they're really just moving at a linear pace. Their life is a string of days together, a string of weeks together, months together, years together. There isn't real growth because there's no real reflection. And so they don't have the opportunity to learn and then apply those lessons. And so what I've tried to do is every day, what are the little lessons I'm learning so that I'm aware of those lessons and I can apply those lessons tomorrow in those conversations so that I can be just a little bit better. I don't sit down December 31st, January 1. What do I need to do better? Because I have a system that already works. I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. I just need to keep reflecting just five minutes every day, figuring out, hey, this is what happened today. Here's what did well today. And here's what I want to do better tomorrow. And if you do that over the course of days, weeks, months, years, it's so incredible. You start to, like what I said before, look at what you said a year ago and scratch your head like, how was I that foolish? How did I think that was effective? Because you're not just lining days up in a linear fashion. You're starting to stack lessons on top of one another. It's interesting. What you're talking about is a little bit every day, being mindful, paying attention to what's happening and being introspective, kind of, hey, what did I do well? What did I not do well? And so forth. It's almost like the concept of compound interest as it applies to personal improvement. Just tiny little changes every single day make a huge difference. I do want to go back, you know, and Aaron, you and I know each other well enough that I hope you don't mind my challenging you on something. But one of the things we talk about is we can say vicious things to ourselves. What an idiot I am. I would say, especially what you've achieved at such an age, and I can't wait to see what you're going to do in the years to come, you just keep getting better and better. You're looking at improvement. But we talked in this show about our mindsets and the things we say to each other. I think it's important to always be kind to ourselves in terms of the things that we say, right? Because we could be hyper self-critical. It's like little paper cuts when we say these kinds of things to ourselves. So not sure if you have any thoughts around that. No, it's an astute observation. It's something you're not the first person to tell me that I utilize self-deprecating humor. It's almost comforting in a way for me, psychologically. It's where I run to frequently. I love self-deprecating humor. It's a lot of fun, but you're right. It's not productive in some ways when I do go down that route. I've had to work through this, especially the past five years. I think part of leadership is developing my self-confidence and I'm not naturally a confident person. I did not have a good time in high school. <laughs> I was not one of those kids that was just absolutely crushing it. I've had to develop the confidence that I have. It's taken a while for me to get where I am and I still have a long way to go. How can I be more kind to myself? How can I be more confident in my abilities and what I have to offer and do that without a lack of humility and without arrogance. And I don't always nail that one, but yeah, it's something I've had to work on. And I hope you don't mind my saying it. I say it out of friendship, really. I don't personally have a horse in the race. I just hear you say this and I'm like, I think a lot of people do this. I've said it to myself. I'll look at something because I'm so stupid and say, like, well, wait a second. You know, I'm not stupid and I shouldn't even say it that I'm stupid, but you know, could I have done something better? Yes. Am I getting better? Yes. I just want to affirm the success you've achieved and that you're achieving and the contribution you're making to an industry. So I wanted to bring that up I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Dale Carnegie, because you've mentioned that Dale Carnegie and how to win friends and influence people in particular has been a really important part of your journey. Would you share a little bit about that? I feel like it must have been the first time I really started to understand leadership is when I read How to Win Friends and Influence People. A lot of people ask, you know, what books do you read? And that's one of the three books I've recommended since I read it, I think in high school was the first time. 
I think my dad gave it to me. I don't know how I found it. I think it was my dad, but I read it for the first time. It made so much sense. There's nothing complex about it. It is so simple, so applicable. And right away, you're like, of course, criticizing people doesn't work. Why do I need to read that to understand that? Of course, I know that. But then you start to think like, well, wait a minute. I just criticized somebody 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I actually, no, I do need to read this. I do need to better understand this because I'm doing exactly what he's saying not to do. This is great. And it's the only book I've read consistently over the past decade. I've probably read it at least five, six times cover to cover because even as I become a better leader and communicate more effectively and be a better disciple of what Dale Carnegie and others teach, you still need that reminder. You need that refresher. You can still find yourself slipping. It's almost like a perishable skill. You don't just figure out, oh, I shouldn't criticize people. And then you never criticize someone ever again. You need to revisit these principles frequently. Like you don't figure out how to shoot a free throw. Cool. I know how to shoot a free throw. And then three years later, you haven't shot a basket since you're not going to hit the free throw again. <laughs> the skill's gone and the leadership's the exact same way. And the principles that Dale Carnegie first taught in that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, it just hit me like a truck. I've been a big disciple of it since. And I share that book with as many people as I can because I think everybody's a leader and I think leadership is a skill. And this is what's taught by you, by Jocko, by other leaders that I've followed. I try not to come at it from like, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business owner. And because I'm a business owner, leadership is important to me and my job. No, it's important to everybody. If you're a parent, leadership's really important because that's all parenting is, is you influencing your children to develop into great human beings. If you're a part of a church group, you're leading others. If you're really interacting with any other human beings, you're leading. And so that's what I love about this book and the principles Dale Carnegie has to teach is because they're not complicated. They're very simple. And then like I joked with you, I think the last time it's well over a hundred years, right? That's 112 this year. Yeah. So you don't become a 112 year old organization by accident. Like I think if it was snake oil, someone would have figured it out by now. Like, <laughs> hey, wait a minute. This is nonsense. And so if it was nonsense, you wouldn't have impacted the tens of millions of people you have over a century. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I mean, you've got a book that's been a best selling book for 87 consecutive years. You've got a global organization. We've got franchisees and team members all over the world in 86 countries. And like you said, I mean, you wonder how is that possible? It's possible because the things that Dale Carnegie thought and developed really are powerful. We say it's common knowledge, but it's not necessarily common practice. The world is our workshop to practice these skills. I'll tell you, I mean, having kids has been a great opportunity to practice. Don't criticize, condemn, and complain. I'm still, I feel like I'm at 101 sometimes because it's easy to revert back to that. And that's one of the things I think that Dale Carnegie realized. He said, you know, the laboratory for the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, really came from his life. It came from the world. It came from the kinds of experiences you're talking about. You embody a trait I think that's really important probably for all of us and maybe something we could learn from, which is boldness. You were bold in starting a company. You were bold in leading an industry and being a thought leader and an influencer. And you were bold in organizing this conference this past year, this Dirt World Conference. And just for the context for our listeners, Aaron and his team had a concept of organizing a conference that people could come to from around the world, around the dirt world and problems that face the dirt world and solutions and so forth. And they decided with, I don't know what, Aaron, eight months, not a lot of lead time with you and Jason Richmond and your team, you said, hey, let's throw down a challenge. We're going to make this thing happen. And you put together really an exceptional conference in a very short period of time. You had 800 plus people, really well done, but you took a chance because you could have been out a lot of dollars, a lot of resources that went into that. Feel free to talk a little bit about the conference if you'd like. And what advice do you have for people about taking risk and being bold and not being afraid to fail? The conference is funny because it first came up in conversation last January. And in December, we had laid people off. And so when it came up in conversation in January, I was not excited about it. I was not having it because I had my tail between my legs. <laughs> we had just been through a horrible experience and 
we needed as a business to focus and to get ourselves healthy. We were an addict and we were spending too much money and we had raised investment and we weren't prepared for it and we didn't handle it very effectively. And we had realized that at that time, but last year, I didn't want to take anything on new. I was like, Hey, we've got to focus on what's on our plate right now. We have more than enough. I've got my potatoes. I've got my steak. I don't need to add like birthday cake right now. We're good. But fortunately I have other great leaders at this business that I trust wholeheartedly. And so the other great leaders, Dan, Randy, Jason, Jonathan, who's on our board, and then others, they got together, they made the case for it. And they said, no, this is actually exactly what we need to do this year. And we're going to do it in November. You know, again, as a leader, I don't need to have all the good ideas. And so if someone else has a good idea and they're able to back it up and justify that, no, this is the time, this is a good idea. And this is why we ought to do it financially, from a brand standpoint, for our mission, for the industry, hey, if you're all in on it and this is going to be what you say, I'm all in on it too. Let's go all in on it. And once I was all in on it, I'm all in and we were all all in on it. And so while there was the potential for it to fail, we had never held an event this big before. Our goal was to have 800 people. We ended up with over 750 construction executives from 300 plus companies across the United States in a busy time of the year, November, which is when they're trying to cram work in. We ended up pretty close. I think a big time success. It could have failed. That's not how we saw it. And how I see it is, hey, let's give it our all. Let's give it everything we have every day. Because if we do that and we end up short when this event actually shows up, we can at least sit here and say, hey, we gave it our best shot. We did everything we could. And what more can you do if you can genuinely look yourself in the mirror and say, hey, I did my best. We did our best. And you fell short. You fell short, but you did your best. And so that's how I've always looked at it is, hey, yeah, we're going to take some risks. We're going to do some things that have never been done before, but we're going to give it our all. We're going to give it our best effort. We're going to be all in. We're not going to waver. It's not going to be, oh, you know, maybe this, maybe that. We're pushing our chips in the middle of the table. And if we come up short, we come up short. But at least I can live with that as opposed to, hey, you know, a little too risky. Uh, it's just not the time. And then you're sitting there like, oh, what if, what if we did that? What if we could have done that? And now I'm sitting here. Thank goodness we did it because it was one of the best things we've ever done as a business. So that's what I would say is do what you think is right. And then give it your best effort because at least at the end of the day, you can say, Hey, I gave it my best shot and I came up short, but I didn't have anything else to give. Yeah, isn't that great though? I mean, I can think of many times where things did not work out the way that I wanted to, but I worked really, really hard, gave it my best. And you know, you never really regret that. You might learn from it if you've got the right mindset. You say, hey, what could I have done differently? And then the next time it'll be better. But you know, when you give it your all, it's always worth it to do it that way. Yeah, 100%. And if you think about what you're most proud of in life, and happiest of in life. It's whatever you've given your all to. It's what you've dedicated the most effort to. It's a direct correlation, no matter who you are, if it's your kids, your job, your relationship, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it hasn't been easy and you've dedicated effort to it. Business is the exact same way. I mean, we got one life. Let's go for it right now. I've heard someone say, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. So one thing I've been doing, Aaron, with the show is I've been going to ChatGPT and I've been explaining a little bit about the show and about the guests. And I'll say to ChatGPT to give me some questions that you might recommend and I'll get a list of questions. And then I'll say at the end, you know, if there's only one question, I did this. I went and I said, I'm interviewing Aaron Witt. And if you could ask Aaron Witt only one question, what would it be? So I'm going to read you this question. This is from ChatGPT. So it'll probably be the best question we've had for the entire interview. What fundamental principle or value do you believe has been most crucial in guiding your success as a leader and entrepreneur in the construction industry? So I grew up around very accomplished people. And this was a huge blessing, a huge blessing that I had no understanding of at the time. I got to learn what high achievers do day to day. I didn't learn about as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old about business. I didn't understand what they were actually doing for work, but I got to see how they talk to people, what time they woke up, when they went to bed, did they drink? How much did they drink? What did they eat? What did they wear? Where did they live? Why did they live there? 
I got to just be around these people and see what high achievers did day to day, which most people don't have the opportunity to, especially as a child, which was so, so amazing. I went to school at Phoenix Country Day School. So all of my friends' parents were somebody. And so it was all my friends' parents. So you'd be at your friend's house, the parents would be together, and then the parents have friends, and naturally their friends are high achievers and whatever they're doing. And so you're just around all these high accomplished and all these different categories, surgeons, lawyers, business people, sports team owners, whatever it is. And so I got to see the daily habits. And I think one thing that's been so valuable for me above all else over the past five, six years is like what we've already talked about just doing a little bit every day. And how could I have been better today? What conversation could I have approached differently today? What do I need to do today to make sure that I'm good to go, that I can look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, I gave today my best shot. I gave it all I have. And so I've tried to break things down into just days. All I have is today. And so what do I need to do today to make sure that I'm good to go. And that consistency, that daily action has allowed me to progress way faster than I think I could have otherwise. If I would have set out and said, you know, I'm going to have these five-year goals. I just don't think it works. I don't think it's all that effective because it's just too big. It's too much. But if I think about, so what do I need to do today? What conversations do I need to have today? I need to work out today. What do I need to eat today? How can I learn how to communicate better today? I don't know what it is today, but what do I have to do today to be a better leader, be a better individual? And so I think that would be my answers is I've learned to break things down by day and to focus on consistent daily action because that is what really adds up over time. It's so true. I mean, the small things we do, as you said, even earlier over time, but today's all we have. And one of the things that Dale Carnegie talked about is the importance of living in daytime compartments. I got a beginning of the day and I get an end of the day. What can I do this day? I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about next week. I might prepare for it. I might do things to prepare, but you know, let's make the most of today because we don't know how many days we're going to have. Aaron, you've been fantastic. If people want to learn more about BuildWit, how do they do that? Buildwit.com, B-U-I-L-D-W-I-T-T. I'm on social media, Aaron Witt, A-A-R-O-N-W-I-T-T, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere. We're all over the place, but don't fall unless you enjoy seeing earth moving and building stuff because that's all you're going to find. Yeah, well, the videos are super cool. I saw something you posted on uh, LinkedIn yesterday about the organization that this company had. Yeah, yeah, no, that was a mining company shop in North Dakota. It's a coal mine. And yeah, their shop is just very organized and it's very nice to look at. It's an important principle. It's, hey, they're organized here, which means their shops are very well run. Go figure. So yeah, that's the kind of fun stuff we get to see. Awesome. Any final thoughts for our listeners? No, I'm just super happy to be here smitten because like I said, the Dale Carnegie organization, the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People has been instrumental to where I'm as an individual human being. So it's cool to be a part of it. Well, it's cool to have you here. It's cool to be a partner. It's cool for Dale Carnegie to be a partner of BuildWit and Dirt World. And we're excited about all that you're doing and the great companies you're doing it with. So thank you for being on the show today. Sure. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success and help you take command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and following us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. For more exclusive content, subscribe to our Dale Carnegie YouTube channel and follow us on social media. As always, Thank you for listening, and we're looking forward to you joining us for the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.